All right, um, so my name's Will Lindsay. Uh, I am a, uh, what do I do? Um, I, I teach game design at Ryder University. Um, started a program there a couple years ago. I've been teaching game design and interactive media for, oh, 11 or 12 years. Um, I am an artist by trade, so uh, I do not remotely have anything related to an engineering background. I think that gives me an advantage as a teacher um, because I, I, um, I learn code empirically and I teach code empirically. So I mess up, I make mistakes, I try over, uh, start over again. Um, and it works pretty well. And it, 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 for, the, for the younger set, for my students, it keeps them engaged. Uh, and it works pretty well, um, as long as we can get a picture on the screen. I have been trying for a few years um, to teach uh, 2600 programming um, in that venue. And I'm not quite there yet. Um, but you guys might be able to grasp it here. Uh, last, uh, the last VCF, I did a talk on chip eight. Um, and that's been my weapon of choice for teaching retro computing. Um, it's kind of a toy language, so it gives you the very, very, very beginnings of assembly language, um, which is scary enough for uh, students who are coming from uh, upper level languages or no languages at all. Um, so let me, uh, let me talk about the Atari for a minute. Um, oh, let's see, so there it is. There's an Atari 2600, and we all know that one. Uh, and it was designed initially to do, bear with me here. Geez, where did I put all my pictures? Uh, this was the goal when they designed this thing. That's the kind of graphics they were hoping for, right? And in fact, the, the entire system was designed around uh, the games that were known at the time, which was pretty much Tank and Pong. And so when they designed this thing, they pretty much thought it would be a universal machine that could play lots of versions of Tank and Pong. <laughs> and because of that, the graphics and the way the uh, system was designed is designed to do exactly that. Um, and as an example, and I'll get a little deeper into it later on, um, there, are, um, there are various registers, there are various areas in memory that are designed to make it a little easier for a game programmer to get graphics on the screen. Uh, and the things that they thought every game designer would need at this point was there would be two players, and each player would have one bullet, so tanks and tank bullets, uh, a background, uh, some, a background color, I should say, and then a background with some uh, shapes, that could, uh, may or may not be uh, part of the game, uh, and a ball, just in case you were playing Pong. And that was it. So uh, it worked, it worked really well for this. Uh, and compared to other things that were on the market at the time, um, I think things worked out. Within a couple of years, programmers got much sharper than uh, the original designers. Um, and they did some amazing things on this machine, and that's part of why this machine has kept me fascinated for so many years. Um, looking at that and knowing that they're still only dealing with two player sprites, two bullet sprites, a ball sprite, and then one background color. Um, there's some amazing things happening here in programming. So people came a long way in a very short amount of time. We're not remotely going to get here today. <laughs> um, but I can kind of talk about the basics and how people started to move in that direction. Oh. So I have a sense that, uh, that some people in the room are uh, from asking previously. So there's some knowledge of assembly language and 6502 programming. Um, so to talk about the Atari for a second, um, the Atari, whoops, you guys don't need to share at files. We'll throw that back up. Um, so the processor in here was a 6507. That is a chopped down, hacked, cheap version of the 6502. It, the language is the same, which is awesome. So it made, uh, it made it transferable. It made it an easy skill to learn this new machine for most people. Um, it's hacked down in the sense that it uh, only addresses a very tiny section of memory that the 6502 was capable of. There's some other changes that were made, it, made to the chip um, to make it cheaper. 
Uh, one of them is that there's no interrupt pins on the chip, which is strange. Anybody who's dealt with video game design or games in general, um, for many, many, many years, uh, interrupts were kind of the heart of what we do. If the player pushes a fire button and they don't see a bullet on the screen, they're bored already, right? So that immediate gratification has to be there. But there were ways to work around that in here, uh, and I think they did a pretty good job at it. Um, these controllers are kind of interesting. My students have barely seen anything like this, which is kind of interesting. Um, so uh, a little bit of history and understanding that one. Again, coming from tank, and I think the original joysticks were derivative of maybe actual tanks, um, where you would have two joysticks or at least something similar to that. Um, the idea was nice. I know uh, most people my age had carpal tunnel by the age of seven. Um, it's not quite ergonomically friendly. Um, it does up, down, left, right, and fire. Um, it goes through a regular nine pin serial, so we could squeeze a little more in there if we had to, um, but in general, they didn't design it to be that way. Um, it, the processor can handle parallel inputs, which means you could theoretically fire and move at the same time, theoretically, um, at least fast enough that we don't notice it as people. Um, so this is what folks had to work with. Uh, and let me start talking about how they did it. Uh, I'm going to pull up a memory map real quick. This isn't a real memory map. Uh, and of course, the font's way too small. Bear with me. Obviously not a real memory map, but it's enough to get us going. So uh, besides the 6502, there's another chip in there, um, the television interface adapter, TIA chip. Um, and all of the uh, different chips had slang names. There's also uh, something called the Riot chip, which basically handled in and out, uh, input, output, and timers. Um, there's a tiny, tiny bit of RAM, teeny, tiny bit of RAM, as you can see in there. Um, and then the games themselves are on ROM, so they're on the cartridge, originally designed to either be 2K or 4K, uh, and that was it for a long time until people figured out bank switching um, and software bank switching, which made things a little nicer. Um, very, very limited. So what are we looking at? Uh, do, 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 do. 128 bytes of RAM. 128 bytes of RAM. So the picture of the Atari that I just had up there is a little bigger than that, uh, to kind of give you a sense of that, yeah. Uh, the screen, let me pull up one of those again. I'll pull up combat again. We can't really think in pixels, uh, but if we were thinking in pixels because we're digital folks, um, this screen is 160 by 192. The 192 has to do with scan lines on an American television back in the 70s and 80s um, using the NTSC format. Uh, a lot of that space is wasted space, so we're not really seeing the full picture of it. Very, very low resolution. Um, I'm giving another talk on Sunday specifically about the game Adventure and how that was adapted from text games at the time. Um, and one of the things that I always think is a miracle is the fact that you can get anything to even look recognizable with this amount of pixels. Um, so that is definitely part of the charm and troubles um, with, the, with the 2600, uh, with the Atari. Do, do, do. I'm skipping all over the place. Um, unlike almost every machine that came after this, almost every game machine after this had a video buffer. It had a space in memory that was big enough to hold everything or most of everything that was on the screen. Um, this did not. And this is one of the things that makes this such a challenging machine. So in the NTSC signal, um, just to give a gist on old fashioned tube televisions, uh, which uh, most of the people in this room remember, right? Uh, there is a little, uh, to put it in plain English, there's a little gun that's going back and forth that's spraying a beam against the front of the TV. And there's uh, some phosphorus up there that's giving us some uh, persistence of light so that we actually see an image on the screen. Uh, and the signal requires that the beam go, uh, go side to side at a certain speed, cover the whole screen at a certain rate, um, and then return and do it again. 
Uh, the, on the Atari 2600, the processor had to manage that. The code had to manage that, which means the programmer had to know exactly where that beam was at any given moment. And occasionally you hear this phrase, racing the beam. Um, and it's literally this idea that if you wanted to put a dot on the screen, you had to be there in the code before the NTSC signal got there, before the beam got there, and then drop it in the spot. Um, so perfectly timed coding. There were a couple little tricks in there that help us, not many. For the most part, that's what Atari code does, is it just chases this beam around the screen. Um, there is uh, some space, let's see, did I bring this one? No, I just brought the manual. I'll find it in the manual real quick. Bear with me. You can tell I teach in a college. I'm like half prepared, right? <laughs> and inevitably, somebody asks me a question, I get completely off track. OK, so some of you have seen this before. This is a fairly well-known, whoop. This is a fairly well-known diagram in the Atari world. Um, this is how the Atari handles the NTSC signal. So this is the rate that the beam travels. Um, there are, um, do, 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 282, why is that number sliding out of my head? Um, the, uh, I gotta check my brain for a second, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. That's right. 282. 282 scan lines um, on the NTSC signal. Out of that, we actually only see, or most televisions only saw 192 of these. So this little slice in here. Um, there's different reasons that this happened to my understanding. One of them is that tele television manufacturers didn't originally completely agree on this. Um, and so there was some space around the image uh, that sometimes was needed on some TVs and sometimes you had a nice wood grain plasticky bezel that went ran around the TV that covered it. Um, but we could count on that 192 scan lines being useful picture. Um, you'll notice in the emulator that I'm using, um, I have other space above it and below it. And um, this is the, the vertical blank and an over scan. So the vertical blank, uh, it's kind of weird. It's not actual scan lines in a sense. Um, and the horizontal blank, the same thing. There had to be a little bit of time, and we're talking about microseconds here. There had to be a little bit of time when the beam was at the top or bottom of the screen to get back to where it was supposed to be. So it would literally fly back and then turn off, fly back, and then start shooting its beam again. And the amount of time that took is this vertical blank. And then same thing as it crossed the screen from one side to the other, it would fly back and we'd have a little bit of time in there that we weren't drawing pixels that we could slip a little code in there, which is really nice. That's the horizontal blank. So you have 192 horizontal blanks. Everything about the game, the uh, reading the joysticks, the input, scoring, figuring out if things collided into each other, um, anything that had to do with the interaction of the game, um, or keeping track of things had to happen in those two blanks. There were occasionally a couple little tricks to slide things onto the screen. And um, folks probably have a vivid memory of playing games where occasionally there were little, little black lines that would pop up on the left-hand side. Um, and sometimes that was the programmer cheating it a little bit and saying, ah, I'm going to use some of this. Nobody will notice, I swear. Um, it's not a lot of time, frankly. I'm going to pop open some code and jump into it. Uh, I think that's enough. Uh, if, uh, if anybody's playing with the file that I gave them, or if anybody online is playing with the file I gave them, um, we use a compiler called DASM, which is a 6502 compiler that happens to also do 6507. Um, I am currently using an emulator called Stella. Uh, anybody who's played anything Atari related on a PC or Windows or Mac uh, is probably familiar with that one already. It's really accurate. I'm really pleased with it. It's open source. They've been doing a good job on it. Um, nowadays, things are a little bit easier. We've got some cheat files to get us going in the right direction. I've included those. Um, so these header files, VCS header, macro header, 
um, take care of some shortcuts for us. One is there are a whole bunch of address spaces on the TIA that had these lovely nicknames like uh, Kalup Zero, um, Color Luminance for Player Zero, um, these little reminders of what those addresses in memory were supposed to do. Um, one of these header files kind of takes care of that for us, so we can address them the way that they were written in the original manual in 1979. Unbelievable there's a manual for this thing, and it's still hard to program. Um, macros do things for us, like if I lose count of lines, I could just sleep the process or just shut it down for a little bit so that uh, the, the, the NTSC signal can catch up to me. Um, and that happens for various reasons. Uh, I already showed you the memory map, so I'm not going to get into this too much. But basically, this is my RAM space, so I could throw a little variable in there if I wanted. Um, and then this is where the code begins uh, for every cartridge. Um, all the way down at the bottom, um, this little bit, which seems weird to folks, is to guarantee that my compiled ROM packs into that 4K exactly. Um, it's, if it's a little off, I don't know what would happen, to be honest. I haven't tried it. Um, but so it basically, this helps pad it with blank space. This is an odd one. I don't know where this convention came about. Uh, and maybe somebody can teach me a little bit later today. Um, but this isn't even used. Uh, we're literally just using that to fill 16 bytes um, to make sure we have exactly the right space on there. So let's get into the code. Um, there is a nice little uh, macro in here, clean start, that I'm using. And again, anybody who's programmed in the last 20 years for an Atari is using these header files. Um, so there's some things that made it a little bit easier for us. Um, that basically starts the Atari in a known state. If we have everything in a known state, if we know that the variables are all zero, zeroed out, or I'm sorry, the RAM's all zeroed out, that the registers are where they should be, um, it makes things a lot easier. A lot of the registers in the Atari are latched, meaning when you write to them, they stick. So if I want to put the color blue into the background, I don't have to continually write the color blue to that register. I do it once and it sticks there. The problem with that is if I do a fast reset on the machine, and I'm sure every little kid did this in the 70s, you sit there and play with that reset button until it just glitches out, right? Um, and what's actually happening is there's spaces in memory that are um, still filled from the previous program um, and not doing quite what we want to. So this clears it out for us. Um, and then uh, I have this chunk of code starting at new frame right here. And this guy goes the whole way down to here, jump new frame, and the entire game happens in this continuous loop. And that loop is drawing one frame onto the screen. That's all it does. Um, and everything else has to be squeezed in between the lines that I have up here. There are dozens of different approaches to doing this. And there's ways that you can cheat some of this timing. Um, but I basically, I created a dirty way of doing this, uh, or we're looking at a dirty way of doing this, so that it's easy to understand for somebody who's new to this. So uh, remembering this guy right here, we have a vertical blank. There's actually this little section of code right here. I should be pointing to the screen. Um, there's this little section right here called vertical sync. That has to be three scan lines. It basically tells the TV to get ready. Here comes the picture, right? And then the vertical blank. Um, and then we have the actual picture in here, and then some overscan, which showed up on some TVs and didn't show up on others, so we don't use it. Um, and the same thing is happening in my code here. So uh, here's my vertical sync. And again, this was a nice macro that takes care of that three lines for us. Frankly, I could have synced written three lines at sync, but I got used to using it. Um, this little chunk of code right here, so I'm loading uh, 37, and I'm going to speak very lightly about the code, since I know not everyone in here uh, codes uh, for the 6502. Um, basically, what this is doing is I'm loading a number of 37 so that I can count down to zero. Um, and each time that it counts down, I sync a line that's a scan line going across. So this is really cool. This is one of the smartest things they did on this machine. This W sync is a strobed register. It doesn't matter what value I put in there. I can put anything in it. And what it will do is basically stop everything until the TV gets to the beginning of the next scan line. 
So the beauty of this is I know exactly where that thing is. And again, if I lose count for various reasons, like I have some decisions or conditions that changed, and I don't know how long that took me in code to get there, I can just pause, wait for the sync line, and then start up again, right? As long as I'm in a certain range. So all this little loop of code is doing is counting to 37 and syncing, waiting for that sync 37 times. And then when it's done here, when it actually hits zero, this line, and again, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but this line says, okay, we're done looping, and we can go on to the next line of code. The next line of code, there's the 192. So from here to here, boop, 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 from here to here is the picture. That's the game. That's the part we see. I didn't do anything in there yet, but this is where everything's going to go once we actually get to it. And then this little chunk at the bottom is the 30 lines of overscan. And again, we can't really, we can do a little bit in there. We can't really draw pictures to the screen, um, but we could per perhaps sneak a little bit of logic in here. Um, I'm going to, for fun, go ahead and compile this real quick. And uh, again, I have a pretty clear map to this. If you're playing with the file or you want to play with it later, um, I have uh, the basic command you would need for DASM for any of the three operating systems you might be using. Um, so this is exciting. I like that zero right there. It means I didn't make any mistakes. Sometimes while I'm yapping on stage, I'll uh, accidentally hit the keyboard and throw some characters in there that the compiler doesn't like. Um, and from there, so I compiled uh, a, a ROM called vcf1.bin, and I'm going to jump out to Stella here. And that's not Stella. I'm going to jump out to my emulator here, and that should have refreshed. There it is. I am now emulating nothing on an Atari 2600. <laughs> and we're done. Um, yeah, I, my students, uh, they constantly ask me, why? Why do you want to learn about this? Why do we do this? And to me, having limitations is the secret to creativity. When you are absolutely limited in an area, you start to think, how can I get what I need done in a tiny amount of space or a tiny amount of time? And those limitations, I think, really created the ingenuity that turned into our game culture right now. So there it is. I got a black screen. I'm going to jump to another piece of code. I shouldn't have closed that. All right, I guess we'll go with this one. Okay, so this is the same. This is the same code, and I added a little bit. Um, not a terrible amount. Um, the next thing that I would like to do is get some color on the screen. Um, and I actually probably could have done that in the last bit of code, but uh, I got lazy up here. Um, so I'll get back to some of these added lines. Um, right, let's see, where did I put it? Pardon me. There it is. Down where the picture's being drawn, so there's this chunk of uh, 192 visible lines. I've added a whole bunch here. Um, the initial thing, the next step that I would have done is just added those two lines. So what we're looking here at, at, at these two lines is actually using one of the drawing registers. Um, and this is a good one to get started on. So I'm loading a value into the accumulator, and then I'm stashing the accumulator into this register that is called color, um, color luminance for the background. And so this is going to take whatever color 80 is and write it to the background. Um, and it happens to be a lovely blue. And uh, in this file, and people have mapped this over the years, you can actually write a program to draw all these, which is kind of nice. Um, there is a color palette. So when this thing came out, 128 unique colors. I don't think that's true. I actually, I feel like this row and this row are the same. Um, 
And it hardly matters because some of those colors are close together. What's actually happening here is there's basically uh, 0 through F, 16 different colors. And then there's different luminance ranges of those colors, so how bright they are. Um, that's kind of what's happening. Uh, it gets a little murky when you kind of go from one color into another, like these oranges into greens. Um, but that's the idea of it. Uh, we're obviously not putting high resolution pictures on here, so this was enough to get the job done. Initially, when this machine came out, they called it a four color machine. Um, they thought there would be four colors on the screen at the same time. And when I go back to, uh, I should just leave it open. Why do I keep closing it? When I go back to this guy, you can kind of see where that came from. So you have a register, C-O-L-U-P-0. This is the color of player zero. They called it player zero and player one instead of player one and player two. Um, and so my tank on the left is that color. And my tank on the right is that color. And the scores happen to match for various reasons. If either of those tanks fire a bullet, that bullet happens to also be the same color, we could switch that up a little bit. Um, the background is a color, and so that's the register I just used, that color luminance background register. Um, and then the, uh, the environment, so if you were gonna put anything else on the screen, draw pictures in the background, things like that, that could be another color. And that was it. Um, and that's the way they did it for a while. Um, so this is how you do that. You stash a color in that register, and, the, and the, it's, it's latched. So in fact, you could do it before the game starts, and those colors will maintain throughout the game, which is really nice. So I don't necessarily have to waste cycles doing it. I am doing that here because later on, I have intentions of changing those colors, which is one of the early tricks that people figured out about this machine. Um, I won't bother with the compiler just that because I'm in a separate file. Uh, but the next thing I would want to do after I got some color on the screen would be to actually get a sprite on the screen. So we're going to play around with player zero. Um, and it is tricky. I think this is one of the hardest parts about the Atari. Um, so this chunk of code right here, let me scroll down a little bit. And again, this is within the 192. Let me kind of explain what's happening here. I created a, uh, I created a variable at the top, um, Y position, which is where on the screen that I want the sprite to be once I draw it. Um, and then I also created, uh, I, I created this uh, name to represent the height of the sprite. Um, sprites in Atari had to be one bit, one byte wide, so eight bits. So they could have eight pixels. Those pixels could be on or off. When they were on, they were the color you assigned to the register. When they were off, they were the background color. Um, and that's it. But they could be as tall as the whole screen. And there were a couple games that did this. So instead of using as a character, they could use as a wall or a force field or something like that. Um, So this is basically starting with my 192. I shouldn't be standing in front of it like this. This is basically starting with my 192, um, and then which, which is up here in a line. Um, and then as it's decrementing, it's going through and it's checking. It's looking for the position of the sprite within those 192. I happen to put it at 100 right here. And when it finds it, it says, OK, we're in the sprite. So for all of the scan lines, where a sprite is being drawn, that number is going to be passed down to this chunk of code. And if the sprite's not being drawn, we're going to pass this zero down. We're just going to load a zero in there and use it. Let me jump to the fun part. Here it is. This is art. Right here. Art on the Atari. So this is my actual sprite. This is how you draw sprites in here. For various reasons, I drew this upside down. When you see decompiles of other people's codes, sometimes they're upside down, sometimes they're right side up. I find this a little easier when people are starting. I know it seems strange that drawing upside down would be easier, but when you're actually counting the scan lines, it's, it is a little easier to understand what's going on. Um, 
what's happening here is I have this uh, padding byte of zero. The way my code is set up, and again, there's a bunch of different ways to do that, but the way my code is set up here, when the sprite is not being drawn, the command to draw is still there, but I'm putting zero graphics in. There's no graphics there, so it goes through and it pretends it's gonna draw, and then nothing shows up on the screen, which is fine. Um, and so in every case that there is no sprite, it's gonna draw this line with zero pixels on it. From here on out, and if, if you squint your eyes and step back a little bit, you can kind of see a picture in there, right? So that is an upside down, uh, something that looks like a Space Invader from Space Invaders with two little antennas. Um, and I drew some X's over here so you can kind of see it. If the lines were squished together, you'd get a sense of that. Um, and now you see exactly why the graphics could only be eight pixels wide. So let me hop back up here to where we're actually drawing it. I feel like I'm speeding through it, but we're already a half hour in, aren't we? Um, this chunk of line is basically, I'm moving my accumulator over to the Y variable so that I can use it as an index into the drawing. Um, and this is basically collecting which line on the sprite drawing I'm in. And then I'm waiting for that sync. And then I am writing the graphic to this register. GRP0, that's the graphics for player zero. All of these different graphics that you learn to memorize really quickly are in the Stella manual, that manual written in 1979. Um, and I provided that in the zip if you haven't seen that one before. Um, this next chunk right here, I'm actually going a little crazy and I thought I would make a color lookup table. So at the same time that each line of pixels, each scan line of the sprite is being drawn, I can change the color. That was not in the intentional design, but I'm not doing anything else with my time right now in code, um, so I can draw some pretty pictures. So what I did with that one, it actually works the same way. I'm using Y as the same index, and I'm going down here to color frames, and these hex, this could be a little confusing, um, these hex represent the different colors. And again, uh, yeah, I don't think I'll bother pulling it up. Um, this basically is for um, the first nibble, I'm sorry, the first part of uh, this is um, the color, and then the second part is the luminance, right? And there's a nice graph inside the manual that tells you exactly what colors you're getting. I, I being an empirical coder, this was, I was so excited when I first started doing this um, that I just started stabbing numbers in there to see what colors pop up. Um, and you get some really nice muddy browns, and you get some crazy blues, and you never get the red you want, ever, ever. Um, but there's a lot you can do with it, so it's kind of fun. Um, I'm gonna, let's see. I'll go ahead and compile this one real quick so you guys can see it. I got a lot of windows open and a little bit of space. There it is, not very exciting. All those lines of code. So here's the two lines of code that created the blue background. So if you remember, I took the 80 um, and stuffed it into the register called uh, color luminance background. Um, and then there's my sprite. Now it's drawn right side up because I was staring at the top and working down from the bottom. Um, it's interesting, in other uh, game consoles I've programmed for over the years, there's usually a convention where you have an origin. You know where 00, zero is on the screen. In the Atari, you put it where you need it at that moment. Uh, so I happen to be working from the bottom in this case, because uh, it's a little easier to count time. Uh, and you can kind of see the variation in colors that I threw in there. So you can see each scan line uh, is different. Note that this and this wouldn't actually be on a real TV screen if I was looking this, at this on an NTSC screen. Um, so that color register in this particular emulator blows over the, uh, over the blanks. Um, which I question in a real TV, but I seem to have some deep repressed memory of there being color going all the way to the edge of the TV uh, on a real tube television. That was a lot, <laughs> and we didn't even start. Um, instead, talking about code, um, 
Well, I'll talk about the code a little bit, but instead of going deeper into code, um, I'll lighten up a little bit and talk about things more generally. This is step one, if you're learning to create games for the Atari, just getting something on the screen. And it, frankly, it doesn't matter uh, what you're programming on. This is our version of a hello world. First, I always try to get one pixel on the screen. Once I get a pixel on the screen, I want a sprite on the screen. My next step is to move it. Well, there's a little trick here. Uh, I kind of evaded something as I was going through all this code. We know that this is at scan line 100 out of 192, but I didn't tell you how I got it in the middle of the screen. And in fact, it's almost a little bit of a mystery. So there is this nice uh, line that they provided. I'm gonna move around a little code to show you guys how this works. Um, I'm gonna take my sync here. This is actually just writing to registers, so it, the, the sync doesn't have to be exactly at this spot. And luckily, my code, so each, uh, each line of code that I'm using, I can look up and see how many cycles that is. For instance, if I'm uh, loading the accumulator, I know that that's two cycles, machine cycles. Um, those cycles equate out to color cycles on the television interface adapter, that other chip. And for each cycle, that one expects three. So now I know that I can draw in chunks of three or I can time things in chunks of three going across the screen, which is not great resolution when I'm already a low resolution. And if I use that system, and had something move to the left to right across the screen, we'd actually see it hopping as it goes. Um, so Atari was lazy enough, uh, no, lazy's not the right word. They were brilliant enough to let the programmers deal with that problem. Um, but they realized that this would make some ugly games, so they actually did create a register to get a little more finesse in there. So there is a fine register um, to move left and right just a little bit. Just fractions, um, so it can go back and forth from where you could get it timed in code. Very kind. Um, I'm gonna move this guy down so you can get a sense of how this works. I don't know why I brought my Windows machine, that was silly. Um, let's see, I'll do it right here. So after I write to the registers. Um, and then this is, so again, I keep, stuffing, uh, I keep stuffing the accumulator into different places. This is actually the color that I got from here, which is great, but when I get to WSYNC, it's a strobe register. It doesn't care what you put in there, so I'm just using the accumulator because I have it handy. Um, the next register that I need is also a strobe register. Um, so this one is called reset of player zero. And what this is actually gonna do is say, at this moment in the scan line, I want you to draw now as the beam's going across. And I put it right after the W sync, uh, so it should be pretty close to the left hand side of the screen, unless I already messed something up. Let's see. Quick compile here, out into Stella, back up out of Stella and run it again. There it is. So now it's on the left. I have seen 100 comment long uh, arguments on the internet about why this is not all the way to the left. <laughs> um, and there's a, there's a lot going on there and frankly I'm not completely positive of the, reg of the reason but I know that I can use that fine register to slide it over a little farther if I have to. But to get it across the screen in major step, I now have to fill this loop of code the distance or the timing between my two lines, 60 and 61, the amount of cycles that are wasted in there, the more that are wasted, the farther to the right it'll move, right? So if I put in there, oh, let's say I increment a register, that'll take two cycles. If I um, have a branch in there, where maybe I'm trying to go crazy and make a decision during one scan line on a television, that'll take three. And in general, if you add those together, you can get five as kind of the tiniest little increment that we can figure out how to do this efficiently. Um, so we have steps of five that we can go across the screen. And again, not enough. That's gonna be a really jittery picture as I go across, but I can use that fine register 
to move it a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. If I know how I'm doing it, I can preset the register before the scan line starts. So I'm saving a couple cycles of code in there. That's it. That's the heart of it. So now I know how to move something left and right. Reading the joystick after this nightmare, if you can wrap your brain around this, reading the joystick is actually fun. It, it's, you literally just read a register, figure out if it's a one or a zero, and apply it to whatever variable or change that you wanted to happen within your game. This guy again, right? Now we run into something interesting. Anybody who's played this game, first we have a multicolor sprite. So I know how they're doing that, right? I just did it, and that's sucking up a lot of cycles. Plus it moves really smoothly across the screen. So I know that they're using almost every bit of code to the left of the character within that scan line. It's being sucked up by code, and in this case, I'm guessing this programmer really needed that code. To, to do uh, logic and operations. Um, and then there's places where you're drawing two sprites on the same line. Depending on which two, that's easy. If it's another two, it means you have to repeat that whole cycle and it'll take the same amount of time and so you have to interlace that in the code and pay attention to how you're doing that. And then on top of it, you've got this background, right? And that has to be drawn in that amount of time. So I know that some amount of cycles is being used up for that. And then I, and I have no idea, to be honest, how they're doing this in this piece of code. And, and I should probably spend a lot of time with the decompile. I haven't seen good remarks on this file yet, and, which I still need, frankly, um, to be able to read code and really understand the logic behind it. Um, but the, uh, remember there's, Player one, I'm sorry, player zero, I'm guessing is here. Maybe player one, because I know this is moving in the screen. Occasionally I've seen two or three skulls rolling across the screen in this game. Um, and what I'm guessing is happening with that is they're actually not drawing every frame. So they are storing a variable and counting frames and saying, okay, I'm gonna draw this every third frame or maybe even every fifth frame. And anybody who's played Atari games knows on the more exciting games, things start looking really flickery. To the point right around the video game crash when the port of Pac-Man comes out on this thing and you could barely see the ghosts if they were near each other, <laughs> right? Because they were only showing up maybe every 20 frames. We only have 30. We only have 30 to work with, right? So two thirds of the time they're not on the screen. Um, I know that these, uh, if we weren't in a still, I know that these are force fields and they're kind of blinky and shaky. That's kind of interesting. I feel like the programmer might have known that this was gonna be the case because they're splitting this over multiple frames and so they're using it as part of the story. They're using that aspect of it, this kind of blinky, faded look to it and say, oh yeah, I meant to do that, right? And just being very careful about which sprites they're picking to do that. That was a lot, I don't know where we are in time. I think I got to most of the end of this. Uh, again, if you're playing with this file, um, I've, again, I've been teaching this stuff for years, um, but I based a lot of this on uh, something called 8-Bit Workshop, which is online, uh, and an excellent book um, designed by Steve Hug. Is he here? I always wonder when I'm talking about people on stage, no? He's probably online, like, you pronounced my name wrong. Um, I highly recommend it. If you are really interested in this, um, this is a great way for people who are coming from almost no programming to get into this. It has very, very nice step by step, much slower than what I'm going through here. Um, if uh, 6502 is a whole nother world, um, and you might wanna try your hand at that first and just get to do some math and things in 6502, um, and I imagine that there are more resources uh, in Camp Evans right now for 6502 than the whole rest of the country. Um, so ask around and look around while you're talking to people. Um, questions? Well, that was easy. I said an awful lot. I think I showed nothing. It's that thing again, the, less, the more constraints you have to work with, the more creativity, and Atari gives us practically nothing. 
which uh, makes me feel like we can be pretty creative with it. Explain this, what you just said about the resources that were available back then and this and the 2K that you had to work with to somebody younger that's been programming and stuff like that. What, what are they? What yeah, are, what does that mean? Yeah, like, yeah. How can you tell somebody that you had to work within a 2K space and now they have gigs and gigs yeah. and, and this stuff was made in this In that space. amount of space. Yeah, it's tough. I, uh, and again, over years of teaching, uh, once upon a time I used to say uh, in my classroom, does anybody have a cell phone? Right, because I could start talking about the memory on the cell phone, because when, the, not this kind, right, the little flippy ones, when they came out, they had about the same memory <laughs> on here, right? And people, you know, boy, if they were lucky, they had Snake on their phone that they could play, right? Um, I teach in uh, something called Unity now, which is a game engine that is absolutely insane. And, and it, there's this whole culture in game design that's been happening for a while, and it's kind of evening out where uh, people are really wasteful of the computer resources because we can be, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, over model, uh, over pack. Don't worry about trimming your sprites. Trim them in code, you know, or, or let some whole library that you loaded up do that trimming for you. Yeah, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, I actually teach this as part of my history class. So I'm a weird professor. I don't like to give tests. So when I teach video game history, instead of giving tests, I say, okay, we're gonna make a program, we're gonna make a game. Um, and they get it really quick. Um, again, I have, I've not had a lot of luck moving this particular one into the classroom. I love it. I think if I had upper level comp size students, they'd be okay with it. Um, but Chip 8 is a great gateway drug as far as assembly language coding goes. And you need to be really efficient um, and I, they especially understand it when they start creating graphics like that, yeah. you know? And I'll do some exercises to warm them up. In fact, I'm doing this right now um, in one of my classes um, where I'll have them open Photoshop and, and it, it, this kind of hammers at home. Open Photoshop and open a file. Photoshop can do millions of pixels, right? open a file that is eight by eight pixels. <laughs> and, they, yeah, and, and then we're gonna draw one of these, right? And I have them use the pencil tool and I have them clear out the dithering so you're either drawing or you're not, one or zero, right? And the funniest thing about it is when I have them do it, they, yeah, no problem, I know how to open a file, I know how to change the file size. And then they zoom and zoom and zoom and <laughs> zoom and zoom and then they get to the farthest range that the computer can handle and it's still this big on their screen, right? And at that moment they're like, Oh, <laughs> that's what eight by eight pixels is, right? Compared to, you know, they've been playing Fall Guys or whatever game came out last week. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I've done Atari program, I've never done Chip 8. What would you say is like the, the difference um, for, for someone entering it for the first time, like between those two? Yeah, so Chip 8, and the reason that I te teach Chip 8 in the classroom, it has a screen buffer. So I can actually draw everything on the screen and it won't tear, I don't have to worry about timing. If I accidentally put it in the wrong place, eh, it's visually in the wrong place, I'll move it. So it's very nice to do empirically. Atari, and again I mentioned as a visual artist, I'm, a, I'm a, an empirical programmer. I try it, see if it works, adjust it a little bit, see if it works. I push this to my students, I'm like, you change one line of code, recompile and look at it, because you may have destroyed it, right? Um, it's very hard to do this in here because it's so much work just to get the initial image on the screen. And then slight things like just moving a sprite, if you are not slick with your code, you can move it into the next scan line, which pushes the next scan line, which pushes the next scan line, and all of a sudden you have this crazy moving overlay happening on the screen. Um, chip 8 is also not color. There is a color version of Chip 8 that came out a couple years later. I don't mess with that. Um, I really, I love Chip 8 because it ran on old machines, you know, the, the RCA Cosmac, um, the RCA Studio 2, that old video game that no one ever talks about. Um, and it works. And there's, and it's a portable language. And I think the students appreciate that. Yeah, we can do anything in emulators, but a Chip 8 emulator, you can put on an 8086 and it works. So that means you can have it on any phone. You can have it on your Wi-Fi router. 
You know, you can put it anywhere. You can ha I, I know a lot of my students who were still using uh, calculators in high school, um, scientific calculators, they could squeeze games onto it. And Chip 8 was one of the first languages that got onto those calculators. Um, so it's a fun one, but that, frankly, the, uh, the screen buffer. <laughs> That's the heart, that's what changed everything in all the consoles that came after this. Are we good, other questions? I'm gonna be around all day if you catch me in the street. I'm happy to chat all day. All right, thanks for your time.